Guitar Business Radio is the podcast for the business of guitar, where you'll always get no reviews, no demos, and no idle chatter. From players to CEOs and in between, if you have a professional or business connection to the world of guitar, this show is your window to insight and information you won't get anywhere else. I'm Jeffrey D. Brown, and I approve this message. So let's get to it. From Guitar Business Media, welcome to the 45th episode of GBR, where we wander into the weeds a bit and talk about some of the inside baseball aspects of the business of guitar, baseball and guitar. I wonder if we can find some similarities there. Let's see, uh, audiences gather to watch people play? Okay, well on that note, we have as our special guest on the show today, another great player who most of you will know of. In fact, he really needs no introduction at all. But of course, if I don't tell you who he is, you won't know, will you? Actually, the, the truth is most likely you do already know. If you read the title of the episode, it's Lawrence Juber, who's had an amazing career starting at a very early age with Paul McCartney and Wings. But then on to become a solo artist with 26 albums to his credit and a rich history that we'll talk about, along with his take on what it takes to build stable revenue streams as a professional musician. So we'll get to that almost immediately, if not sooner. And just a reminder that on Christmas evening in the U.S. time zone, we'll be releasing our holiday show and we'll be featuring many of our previous guests with their special messages for the season. So that's going to be a lot of fun. We're already editing some of those, and they're all different in style and content, so we can all look forward to that. I can just see it now. Happy folks sitting around the fireplace on Christmas night, roasting candy canes and listening to GBR. Wow. Doesn't get much better than that, does it? Of course, you may have a different opinion, and we do respect differing opinions on this show. Now, as I mentioned last week, we will be at the Winter NAM show in Anaheim from January 24th through the 27th, and we'll be doing some floor interviews for our show. So if you're there, look for the GBR logo and say hi. It's always great to meet up with listeners, and maybe we'll see you. And also coming up in January before the show, we will be doing some NAM previews, GBR style. And remember, I said previews, not reviews. We do no reviews or demos. I guess you could say we do some chatter now and then. It's just not idle. And finally, we always want to hear from you about who you'd like us to interview on the show and what topics of interest we ought to cover. We're very accessible. And while you're considering your next move on that, I think it's time we move on to something completely different. Lawrence Juber is a Grammy-winning guitarist who started his career as a session player in the mid-70s, joining Paul McCartney's Wings as lead guitarist for several years, and then continuing on as a solo performer, recording artist, composer, and arranger, with 26 albums and a slew of other credits and awards. He's got a lot to say about the business, so let's get to it, as Lawrence Juber joins us right here and right now. Lawrence, hey... Thanks so much for coming on the show with us today. It's great to have you on GBR. Well, thanks for having me. It's <laughs> it's it's a busy time of year, and I know that um, you're taking some time uh, off uh, during the holiday rush here. So uh, it's great to chat with you. So let's not waste any time and and just dig right into it. So you've been in the business uh, for a while now, I guess we could say. You have a, a, a week or two. <laughs> you have you do have a long history um, and some. I, yeah, I started as a session musician in London. Um, I mean, full time in 1975, but I'd been doing demo sessions for a couple of years before that. Well, we're at, we're right in the same uh, realm because I, you know, I I was right in there at the, at pretty much the same time. So that's why we have the same color hair, although you have <laughs> somewhat more than I do. <laughs> but uh, you know, listen, I want to find out a little bit about, and this is kind of how we always start the show. Uh, I want to find out uh, some of the things in your. Uh, in the early part of your life that you would credit as being the most significant and, uh, you know, and getting you to where you are today? Well, I started playing guitar when I was 11 in November of 63. And 
I hadn't been playing very long when my dad took me over to see a friend of his who was like a an, a semi-pro dance band guitarist who showed me an F major seven chord, which was the most gorgeous thing that I'd ever heard until he showed me a C ninth right after. <laughs> that. It was, and it was just that kind of opened my ears to the, the sonority of the guitar, just the, the sound of what the sound of, of the guitar as it, kind of intersects the nexus of the guitar with harmony and, and music and, and just how they fit together. And not long after that, uh, about a year or so later, there was a local band leader who was a trumpet player who started taking me out on gigs. And so uh, on the bandstand, uh, it was really, that was my, my early ear training. I remember the first gig, the bass player leaned over and said, if you don't know the chords, lad, just play the bridge of I've Got Rhythm. <laughs> <laughs> just introducing me to listen for the the cycle of fifths and then i i discovered that the the kind of the brass ring of being a musician in london at that time you know outside of being in a famous rock and roll band was to be a studio musician and that became my ambition so throughout my teens, I was kind of directed to that. I was studying classical guitar at school, not so much because I wanted to be a classical guitarist, but the technique was useful and getting like grade six and grade eight classical guitar allowed me to continue to study music. I got it. Because my goal was to be a musician. Mm -hmm. you know, both, both my parents were, they grew up in London during the war and it just, the, their educational opportunities were very limited. So neither of them went to college. So I had kind of a vision of going to music school or university to, to study. But, but in high school, being a guitarist, you know, was not legit. It didn't kind mm. of, the teachers didn't really give a lot of credence to, <laughs> to the guitar, um, much to uh, my chagrin. But, but then I just found my own path with it. Um, and eventually I ended up, I did better than they they expected me to do um, when I graduated, and and I in fact better than I expected to do academically. And so um, I I had a place at a place called Leeds College of Music, which was very similar in curriculum to like the Berkeley School in Boston. Got but, it. Okay. Uh, okay. But it meant leaving London, and and I'd already been paying my dues as a musician there, and so I stayed in London. Was a pioneer of, of what they now call the gap year. Whereas I took a year after high school, applied to London University, and while I was waiting for that, I was gigging and I was playing all kinds of all kinds of gigs. But getting starting to get into session work, joined the National Youth Jazz Orchestra, and was studying, gigging, playing in the, the jazz band, and just kind of having an amazing time being 19 years old. And, and being a guitarist around London. Um, and then through a series of circumstances, I ended up when I graduated, I got straight into studio work. And the exposure of being with the, the jazz orchestra, and especially being on television, we did a TV broadcast. And the next day, I got a call from a contractor. In England, we call them fixers. Okay. Uh, he wanted, <laughs> Over here, we call it, that's, that means probably something, something else. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but he wanted to get me started doing sessions. And so that, you know, and, and I was already kind of, even though I didn't really know anything about the granular part of the music business, as far as writing, publishing and all of that, I did know that you show up at a gig with an amp and some pedals and a guitar or two, and you make money, you know, and it's like, okay, Tough. this is a profession. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, I found myself kind of getting into studio work and each year my income was doubling and it was like, this That's is, good. you know, I'm a professional guitar player, which was what my ambition always was. And then I was at Abbey Road one day um, doing a session and I got a phone call from McCartney's management um, and got called in to do an audition and got offered the job. And that kind of was a, a big change. 
Um, it's funny, I was talking to Carl Verheyen the other day, who started off wanting to be kind of, you know, a rock star, you know, playing in bands. That sounds like then, it, yeah. <laughs> then got into session work yeah. kind of without, you know, without planning on it. Um, I was the opposite way around. I really didn't seek the spotlight, even though I'd been doing some writing and playing with bands as a teenager, as well as kind of doing the money making stuff. It just was for me, it was like I, I loved playing and making music and making records too. So you were, uh, when the, the McCartney thing came along, you were about how old? No, your early 20s? 24, mm. I think it was. Um, yeah, it was right around then. Uh, this was uh, in April of 78. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, so 25 at that point. Um, but I'd actually, I worked with Denny Lane uh, the previous September, which was what led me to the audition with with Wings. Um, yeah. And so that, that plucked me out of the studio world because I couldn't be doing both. Sure, sure, um, sure. Uh, but what it, what it threw me into was, was this creative environment where I started to understand that there was this whole other aspect of, of the music business as far as being in a band and spend, instead of spending an hour on a tune you know, in the studio, which you'd normally do in a session, it was a day or two or maybe three. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I started to see that not only did I have the guitaristic skills, but I also was understanding the creative process and also learning a lot about the business end of it. Sure. Seeing Carney yeah. as a publisher, you know, a very substantial publisher. And, and just starting to see the, the whole machinery of it and, you know, what, what I liked about it and what I didn't like about it. Um, but it gave me kind of a master's in, at McCartney University to yeah, my I, education. I, I can imagine. You know, it's, um, uh, you know, we talked earlier, but it's when you look at some of the material that's written about you uh certainly there's always the the blurb in the beginning about uh the years with wings that was uh, on the whole scheme of things that was a fairly small uh period of time as you kind of look back uh as i understand it Is yeah i mean it was, it was three years mm -hmm. of kind of you know pretty deep experience but um but i want i guess what i want to uh, follow up on that. And there's some other things I want to get into as well. But but I can imagine, and I'd like to hear it from you, that uh, that had some impact on your career going forward. And I'm kind of interested to know what that was and, and how that affected things. Did it change things for you? Did it open up opportunities that might not have happened uh, without it? Oh, certainly. Um, the the fact that it kind of burnished my resume, you know, was, <laughs> yeah. it was a good door opener. Um, but as Wings was folding, the music scene, I mean, the economy in England in the early 80s was, was a bit shaky. And the, and the music scene, you know, at that point was, was not great. And I was, I had things going on in New York and I just made the decision that I was going to, you know, hop the Atlantic and reestablish myself in America. And, and I think the wings, uh, the wings credit actually meant more in America than it did in England. OK, that's interesting. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'd already established my my reputation prior to wings uh, you know, and, mm -hmm. in the London music scene. But but coming to America, it, it was it was a door opener. Um, I got into studio work very quickly in New York. Um, I was there for about six months and it didn't take very long for, for things to start happening. I was working on some projects, but, but I met Hope, who subsequently we married uh, the following year. I met her in New York and ended up, she was from LA and it just made more sense for me to come to LA. Mm -hmm. That had always been part of my kind of, my big picture was to establish myself doing studio work in LA too. Um, and, and I got to do that. Um, mostly, I mean, I, there was some connections. Hope's dad, um, was a TV writer producer. 
Um, and he introduced me to some people, but, you know, just basically kind of like hanging out at Valley Arts guitar kind of helped. Yeah, I recall um, those days. I was, uh, uh, even though I've always lived down here in Orange County, I spent many, many, many days up in that with my colleagues in those days. I sort of used to call it the Studio City group. And um, I remember, you know, Mike and Al very well. And uh, right. so a lot of interesting folks, some of them, you know, I'm, I'm sure that we both know well indeed yeah so that was um that that was kind of helped um and just generally networking uh, i got to know some tv composers uh some producers uh, record producers did started getting into doing some movie sessions um then um uh, got into doing some film composing and TV composing. And, and all the while I was kind of writing acoustic guitar pieces, just solo acoustic guitar. And finally, um, you know, my kids, we, we had two kids and I, I didn't want to travel. So I was busy doing a lot of sessions. I was um, on camera on the young and the restless for about <laughs> five years. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I was playing guitar for them. If, whenever they were doing a music show, I would, um, I'd get the call. So, you know, got those union gigs, I mean, health insurance through the union. Sure. sure. You know, in fact, at one point I was on motion picture and, uh, and after. Nice. Nice. But but that, you know, that's the kind of thing that the machinery of L.A., you know, and how you how you kind of keep yourself uh, afloat financially with, you know, with all the especially when I came to America, I didn't know anything about health insurance. We had the national health. <laughs> right. Thing. That's right. You know, so I learned a lot about dealing with that stuff. But certainly being in the union was always, you know, was always a great thing. Um, and then I was offered a record deal. A friend of mine, James Lee Stanley, who's a wonderful singer songwriter, had a small record label and wanted uh, wanted a, an album. And I I had a whole bunch of tunes that I'd written, and I wrote a few more. And we put out this record in 19, November 1990, and it got radio airplay. And people said, "Do more." So I think I've done 26 albums since. <laughs> There's a lot to a lot to listen to, uh, you know, and and there's so much. You, um, I'm going to kind of go over all over the map here, but uh, you, you your focus on acoustic uh, playing now is has, uh, but it wasn't always that way. I mean, you made a a change. You made a shift at some point uh, in that well, direction. The, or? the acoustic thing was always there mm -hmm. from the time I was 13, and I learned. Davy Graham's tune, Angie, from a Bert Yanch record, which Paul Simon covered that same mm -hmm. tune, the Simon Garfunkel albums. Mm -hmm. And that, that particular tune was like kind of one of, it was like a guitaristic bar mitzvah. <laughs> it was a rite of passage that if you, you play this, you know, the descending bass line and the little melody on top, you could do both at the same time. That was kind of an accomplishment. Um, and, and that, with the kind of studying classical guitar and Renaissance music and it just kind of all that, that sound, that plucked finger style with counterpoint, you know, Bach lute suites kind of thing was always part of my consciousness along with ragtime and just general folk picking. Um, but, but it, it ended up getting kind of like fused with, with, jazz vocabulary and rock grooves and the, all the things that influenced me to the point where it, it somewhere along the line, it apparently turned into a style. <laughs> and I had, I had something recognizable. Um, other people were recognizing it before I, I did, but you know, it just kind of added fuel to the fire so that I felt confident that I could start going out doing concerts, doing all, you know, doing the educational videos, publishing, arrangements and original tunes and and just getting into that as a professional direction of being a soloist uh, but with the with the, the artistic um, independence attached to it too so i could do what i wanted you know more more often than not 
One of the things that I find in in talking to players on this show, and and as I've said, you know, multiple times, we we hope to have more. It's still somewhat skewed toward the industry side. But one of the things that I've found really interesting is that uh, more and more uh, players now have to sort of become entrepreneurs. It's uh, and that's and that's changed o- over time. And and I've heard many different stories um, that uh, relate to that. Uh, and it seems to me that you've kind of gone down that path as well. And I'm interested uh, to know how you've kind of assembled for some people. It's a patchwork for other people. It's an integrated array of, uh, you know, closely aligned uh, projects and uh, pathways uh, to create these revenue streams. Uh, so how does that how does that look for you in in terms of the business of Lawrence Juber? Let's put it that way. Well, it actually, I mean, the thing that the, the, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act did when it created a performance royalty was that it, it then created a revenue stream, a new revenue stream. You know, so, you, you know, sound exchange was set up on that. And so, you know, anything of mine that gets played on Sirius, for example, or on Pandora or on Spotify, any of those digital um, outlets, that generates royalties. Now, as a performer, it actually generates a much more substantial royalty than it does as a, a writer publisher. The, the the relationship between movies it got flipped on its head from terrestrial radio, where performers got paid nothing, but the writers mm-hmm. and the publishers mm-hmm. made the money. Um, so I've got tunes, especially stuff from you know. I mean, and there's no shelf life on this stuff. I mean, I've got tunes that are played on Spotify. I don't even know what channel, but the same tunes keep getting used and generating sound exchange revenue. Uh, I have a lot of my earlier Christmas music gets played on um, on Pandora. And probably as we speak. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my top <laughs> my top of my top 10 on Pandora, I think, you know, nine of them are Christmas tunes. Nice. And that's year round, mm-hmm. too. Um, now, obviously, it's not. You know, with streaming, you don't really make big money until you get into billions of streams. Yeah. You know, whereas my streams, my good streams are kind of, you know, somewhere along the line. I think I'm up to about 13 million on the Holly and the Ivy. It's not a huge amount of money, but, but you know, they always talk about music publishing as a penny business. Well, streaming is like that, too. If you have enough tracks making pennies, then mm-hmm. it may not be a deep catalog, um, but if it's wide... It, it brings in, you know, some, some, uh, some value, some revenue. Um, so stuff like that is is helpful. Um, I have my own record company now, mm-hmm. so I also collect on on the the label side as well as on the performer side. But my my back catalog was with Solid Air Records, so that label gets their share of the of the sound exchange revenue. Um, but it's. Uh, but it all helps. You know, now the label you cr- has been going for how long now? When did you start that? My label is like, I think, three years. Mm-hmm. First first release I did was a Christmas record. Because mm-hmm. you know, Christmas music is 25% of the music market. Oh, okay. <laughs> Crazy as it seems. Yeah. Is that, um, uh, what's been the benefit of, of uh, doing that for you? How, can you? how do you measure it? Well, you can measure it very directly in terms of, you know, basically monthly revenue because I get, you know, I have, I have a distributor that I work with and the distributor sends me a monthly statement with a, you know, whatever that month's uh, royalty is. Um, so they're collecting on all the streaming, um, all the streaming outlets. They're also collecting on downloads and some physical mm-hmm. too, but, you know, physical merch pretty much is is for gigs it's for concerts yeah people tend not to buy cds i don't buy cds anymore i haven't I mean, bought I'll, a cd and i can't even remember i i can see way up in the back of the closet up there i can see a stack of cds that i that are probably have so much dust on them that i um would buy vinyl more readily than cds i, I, I can see that I, yeah. but i'm also in a position where i tend to get given stuff too mm-hmm. but but realistically i mean you know apple i use apple music mm-hmm. for example um i don't use spotify on my studio computer because it does something annoying 
which is that it defaults the sample rate to 44.1, and I don't work at 44.1, so I just don't have it in my studio. I have it on my laptop. Um, but but Apple Music is really useful, and I listen to a lot of music for research, you know, for stylistic purposes or if I'm doing an arrangement or whatever. So um, you know, and having done three albums of Beatle tunes for solo guitar, you know, I've listened to a lot of Beatle music. Yeah, though. I can imagine. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, even YouTube, you know, can generate some money, but it's just not great. And the, you know, I've done all kinds of things over the years, high resolution stuff. You know, I, I did a, a project with AIX records, which was a DVD audio that actually did quite well in that kind of, you know, very rarefied, mm -hmm. you know, 50 grand hi-fi system yeah. type listeners you know um so but principally i mean you know it's it's live performance it's merchandise sales i, I have an online store which generates you know some if i have a new release mm -hmm. then i can hit you know my fan base directly with signed copies and stuff like that um and, and it's funny because you know the 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 business of being creative is essentially a retail business, you know, yeah. whether it's getting bodies into the concerts, you know, and how do you accomplish that? How, how much energy do you have to put into your own promotion, you know, in terms of a mailing list? I have a publicist that I use, which gets a certain level of, of activity. Uh, but there's a lot of it is just like getting the photo and the bio to the to the promoter so that they can get out up on the website. You know, having to take care of stuff like that. Um, it's a chore, but it's not an onerous chore. And and that's you know the technology has just made that so much easier. Oh sure, it's changed it. It's changed it all. I mean, uh, in the past, I think um, a lot of artists would really uh, defer all that to to a manager, to an agent, to a publicist, that sort of thing. Uh, now, a lot of times, uh, uh, the artist is handling some of those things themselves. I talked to uh, who is it? Uh, some of the guys that book their own uh, book their own plane rides now, and they uh, you know they'll do hotels or things just because they figured out how to do it better and cheaper. You know, exactly. Well, I do. The the same thing. Um, the only thing I don't do is do my own booking. Yeah. Generally, I have an agent that handles that, but I've always managed myself. Well, not always. I had a manager at one point for um, for some movie stuff, but but typically, I just handle things myself. It's it's a lot easier. You're not having to go through a middleman. Uh, when it comes to things like dealing with theater, I'm, right now I'm, um, uh, we have a musical that we're doing a reading of in New York in February. And then I brought in a, a producer to work with who knows how to do that stuff better than I do. Mm -hmm. you know? So I'll always defer to somebody with more expertise. Um, Nothing wrong with but, that. But the, but the reality is that there's a lot you can do yourself. At least, you know, on the, this level of kind of being an independent artist, performer, musician, just taking care of business. Uh, and, but, you know, when you look at how much the technology has evolved over the last couple of decades, you know, when it, it used to be all phone calls, you know, it's like I would, I, if, when I was comp doing a lot of uh, TV composing, I'd, I'd get up at like 4.30 and be, you know, writing at five o'clock so I could get work done before the phone started ringing. That's right. Yeah. Now the phone rarely rings. Uh, if it does, it's usually spam. Um, but, you know, now I'll get like a million text messages or emails. <laughs> so, but at least, at least, you know, with stuff like that, you can kind of like time shift it. That's right. As opposed to taking a phone call, you know, so... Yeah. Well, it sounds like uh, I kind of think of it uh, and not in a negative way, but, uh, you know, we're all sort of doing a patchwork. There's a, a lot of elements that come together to create a career or a business or, or whatnot. It's it's all different in so many respects. And uh, yeah, let's face it. Musicians pretty much invented the gig economy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I understand uh, you told me that um, on a personal side that uh, that your daughter has gotten into the business uh, oh, yeah. herself. Yeah. Uh, you know, it'd be great if you could tell us a little bit about that and, and what kind of influence or guidance uh, you've been able to give her, if any. Uh, and uh, might also be interesting to, to note how you see the differences between her entrance um, to the business and yours. 
Did you watch Saturday Night Live last Saturday? I can't say that I did, but I'm guessing she was on it. She was on it with Mark Ronson and Miley Cyrus nice. and Sean Lennon. Nice. Too. Um, oh, really? Wow. She, she co-wrote uh, Mark and Miley's new single, Nothing Breaks Like a Heart. Um, and so she was performing with them, you know, singing back up and playing some keyboards and sleigh bells too. Oh, <laughs> um, fun. It was the, the Christmas show. Um, she, she started off writing when she was 14 and, and clearly that was a direction for her. Um, but, and it, it took a long time for her. She did a lot of networking really was not academically based in what she was doing, but she had the skills and, she ended up being uh, managed by Randy Jackson oh. at one point, and he put her in a band. He said, don't try and be the solo singer-songwriter. It's not a career path. Uh, Randy got her signed to Sony ATV Music, um, and then at one point she uh, had written, co-written a, a song that became a, a dance club hit briefly, and, and the A&R people at Sony said, oh, we didn't know you can do that. I have my phone on Do Not Disturb, and it's still ringing. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> I don't know whether I'll edit that out or not. I think it's kind of cool. <laughs> um, so she, um, she, her, her A and R people at Sony said, "We didn't know you could do that kind of thing." You know, they had kind of a pegged as a kind of acoustic guitar, you know, singer songwriter, and then uh, they started putting it together with different producers and writers, and it just kind of evolved from there to the point where she had a hit with uh, Pitbull, a song called Fireball, and then it just kept going. If you go to Ilse Juba on Wikipedia, there's a, a very long list of credits. Nice. Most recently, um, you know, working with Mark Ronson, work, working with Miley. Um, Shawn Mendes' song Mercy was a hit. She wrote that. Um, uh, she wrote the last two songs that Chester Bennington recorded with Linkin Park. Um, so it's very diverse. You know, Sounds like in, it. Yeah. In terms of, of the people that she works with. And there's a Swedish artist, Leaky Lee, who's a, a kind of an indie, kind of has a cult following. Ilse wrote almost all of her most recent album. So um, she is actually making money as a songwriter. That's great. And it's possible because when you write hits, you still get BMI or ASCAP, whatever your mm -hmm. PO mm -hmm. is. Um, you know, because radio airplay generates, still generates royalties. Sync licenses, TV usage. There's still, you know, there's money to be made there. I mean, in my case, I had a and my arrangement, solo guitar arrangement of Stand By Me got used in a commercial and, you know, that generated a master use license, even though it's a Libra and Stola song, they wanted to use the recording. So that generates a license fee. So that kind of thing, it's like, you know, I remember when I was a, a studio musician in London and I, on a Saturday, I'd look at my date book for the next week and there'd be nothing in there. And then on the, by the Sunday night, I'd filled up the week. Um, you just never know. And, and being in this business, it's kind of, for me, it's always the focus is making music, being a better guitarist, being a better musician, um, and how to apply those talents and, and be out there sufficiently being enough of a presence that, for example, I, the, the next thing I have to do is start doing some Beatle arrangements to play with an orchestra because I got asked to play with an orchestra you know, in a few months. Oh, that's going to um, be nice. Yeah. Yeah. it will be, be fun. It's just, and where know, is I, that, where, where is that going to be happening? In Bakersfield, the okay. Bakersfield Symphony Hall. Not exactly the Cleveland Philharmonic, but it's, <laughs> but it's an orchestra. And, you know, the, the opportunity to work with that kind of ensemble is always a cool thing. Yeah, you've, uh, you've ha you have so much. Uh, there's, there's so much to talk about. But, you know, I, I always like to kind of get a, a 30,000 foot uh, perspective from my guests, um, you know, and looking generally at the industry level as well as kind of the personal horizon. So I wanted to kind of start with the broader view of from your vantage point of what opportunities and challenges uh, may lie ahead in, in the business side of things. And then, of course, what the future may hold for Lawrence Juber. It's a it's a mouthful, but I kind of let you run with it any way you want. Well, I think that the challenges on the industry side really are in the copyright area and how, you know, how these like the blurred lines 
lawsuit and what impact that kind of thing has on the business. Um, I think that there are, you know, there are dangers out there. Um, there are some fairly shark infested waters when it comes to um, the idea that somehow the groove of a tune is, is something copyrightable on the basis, you know, compared with what was traditionally the case that the copyright was in the melody and lyrics. There's a separate copyright in the recording. You know, how much should should the should those elements, you know, converge? I mean, if you think about how many tunes use a Bo Diddley groove, and if Bo Diddley's groove had always been a copyrightable thing, wow. how that would have changed, you know, change the structure of things. So there, there's, you know, there's, there's issues there. Same thing with the, um, with the stairway to heaven lawsuit, how much of the substance of music, the actual granular substance of music, how much of that is public domain? And at what point do you cross the line into something that's truly an original creation, as opposed to simply the stuff of music that, mm -hmm. You know, it's like you can't copyright one, four, and five. Yeah, that's right. Because if you could, you know, then a 12-bar blues, would somebody would own it, yeah. much like Happy Birthday to You is owned, yeah. you know. It's the lyric of it is. Um, you know, the, so there's this kind of, you know, potential issues there. And, of course, the the whole area of digital transmission of music and how how it works. I mean, I think that we've actually, as performers, we have benefited from from the way in which the digital transition was handled up to a point, but there's still a lot of stuff that really kind of goes, falls through the cracks. But at least with, with meta information being embedded in the tracks mm -hmm. to the point now where even producers are gonna to start to get some recognition for what they do. You know, being a record producer is not great, because you always used to kind of make your money out of sales, you know, a percentage of sales. But if records don't sell and you're not getting a piece of streaming revenue, exactly how does that work? Mm -hmm. um, which is why producers now get songwriting credit, you know, because if you uh, if you you're actually, you know, if your hands are in the in the in the cookie dough, you know, then you get a piece of the cookie <laughs> at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, so. I think there are challenges there. For me, it's, you know, I'm kind of into a third act part of my life at this point where I've, you know, I've spent a few decades, I mean, basically three decades kind of establishing a style and a, a, a something of, of what I can do. But it's, you know, it's almost just scratching the surface in terms of the marketing side of it, because people are constantly discovering what I do. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about necessarily music fans, or not rock or guitar music fans, but just a more general kind of audience. Mm -hmm. um, but it, this is also a point where I don't want to travel as much. You know, I have yeah. grandkids, I don't want yeah. to be I don't want to be schlepping around the world too much. Yeah, that's uh, understandable. And and so um, you know, and and so being able to combine the just the musicianship and the to some extent the pedagogy of it, I you know I I have an enduring interest in the history of the guitar and advocacy for what the guitar can do within music education or just education in general. Um, that's part of kind of my, my path forward. Uh, my wife Hope and I do a lot of work together. Um, we have a number of musicals that we've written, including this one where uh, we're trying to get launched um, in New York. Um, and uh, she produces many of my recordings. Um, it's, we like to work together. Um, and I've written music for for movies that she's written, for example. Nice. So, you know, kind of there's a, a great synergy there. Um, and other than that, I mean, it's, you know, it's just making sure, the business side of it is just making sure that I get all the revenue that should be coming to me. Right. And that, that seems to be pretty much on an even keel at this point. And, and it's actually, I'm, I see growth with it because, again, like I mentioned earlier, there's no shelf life with this music. Right, right, right. So, discover something of mine from 25 years ago, it makes just as much money as what I wrote <laughs> last month. That's right. It doesn't go bad. 
No, it doesn't. At least if you do it right, it doesn't go. Right. It doesn't get dated. And, and, you know, I've always tried to do something that has kind of a, a, a classic kind of perspective to it. It's an amazing career. And uh, like you said, uh, well, I I still think of myself as uh, sort of in the throes of middle age. I've said that a few times in this show. And the more I say it, the more I believe it. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm good with that. And we, we're kind of in the same uh, realm. So uh, there's well, still a lot to do. One of the guitar magazines recently described me as being well preserved. <laughs> I, kind of like you know, I, I get that every once in a while. So I, I I'm OK with that. Uh, it, a lot of it has to do with uh, how we see ourselves as well. And uh, that's a really important. Uh, really well, important you know, I think the, the great thing about being a musician is that work is play. Sure. You love what you do. It's not work. Yeah. Right. And you play, you play, you, I play the guitar. I don't work the guitar. That's right. <laughs> um, and, and, and there's, there's just so much more to learn, you know, so I'm just a lifelong student of the instrument and of music in general. And it's, it, it kind of keeps, you know, keeps me energized. And that's the, and for all of us, that will help us to live longer and uh, live better. And that's really, so. yeah. you know, it's got to be about the quality. And, Live uh, long and prosper. Indeed. Exactly. <laughs> well, well, Lawrence, this has just been a lot of fun. And uh, I've certainly followed you for a long time. I know you've been on my mailing list forever. And um, <laughs> so for all the different things that uh, that I've been into, and I do appreciate you uh, staying on the list and not unsubscribing and uh, all that sort of thing and kind of made this uh, interview uh, possible as well. So I hope we can uh, uh, catch up again at another time. And as we go into the final aspects of this holiday season, I certainly hope you have a great time of it and uh, that all is well and, and that uh, you can emerge from the new year ready to go back to work. <laughs> Well, I better be because I've got a really busy January. So we'll be we'll be looking. We'll keep an eye on it. And uh, yeah, I just check my website, lawrencejuba.com. Uh, starting uh, January 6th, I've got a run of gigs with the great Scottish jazz guitarist Martin Taylor. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great. Place. And um, then just all kinds of stuff going on so well we'll definitely keep an eye on it and, and again uh, so great to have you on the show and we'll talk again soon all right then well thank you very much Jim. so what did you think of the interview with lawrence juber we always want to hear from you and you can do that easily through the contact page on our website at guitarbusinessradio.com or on facebook and twitter at guitar business you can email us directly at contact at guitarbusinessradio.com. And of course, if none of that works for you, just call us on the GBR hotline at 888-777-2404. You can do that right now if you like, or later, or not at all. Now, one of the things I enjoyed about this interview is that LJ has developed a keen understanding of the need to take the business of being a professional musician seriously. He's put a lot of effort into developing a variety of revenue streams from as many sources as possible. And to do that, he's needed to become educated and knowledgeable about a lot of the business-related details in order to make it work for him. And that shows in the interview. He has a very good grasp of it. At the same time, he knows that there are times when you need to engage others who know more about specific pathways and be able to leverage their knowledge to move successfully forward on many things. You know, taking care of these details and understanding their significance is key to allowing him the creative freedom to pursue his own avenues of interest. As he describes in his own third act, with a variety of unique projects and other aspirations, he's positioned himself in an optimal way that serves him very well. And last week, I talked about creating a personal infrastructure that would provide a long-term foundation of stability, allowing you to more easily pursue your own dreams. Whether you're a professional musician, a business owner, or employee, it's really never too late to establish that foundation in one form or another. It does require taking some disciplined steps on a regular basis, and it also requires you to have a vision, or as we say, a destination. There's a lot of ways to say it, but the bottom line is you have to know generally where you want to go. 
And I say generally because it's not always necessary to know the how part of it to get started. You've heard all this before from me, and, you know, I usually discourage folks from setting narrow pathways or expectations for the journey. There are exceptions for sure, but by and large, the message is always the same. You get it here every week. Stay positive. Stay focused on your destination, but keep all your options open on how you're going to get there. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you again on our holiday special, episode 46. And that's it for this episode of Guitar Business Radio. Thanks for being with us. You can stay tuned and stay in touch at guitarbusinessradio.com.